Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society. Uh, my name is Vince Poor. I'm the Dean of uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Science here at Princeton. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, I'm also delighted to welcome Norm Augustine back to Princeton uh, as the inaugural speaker for our new lecture series uh, entitled Leadership in the Technological World. Uh, this lecture series is sponsored by the School of Engineering's Center for Innovation and Engineering Education. Uh, some of you may know that about the center. It's a fairly new activity here, and uh, it's been uh, in place for about a year and a half. Uh, this is the main goal of the center is to uh, educate leaders, lead both engineers and non-engineers, uh, who can uh, lead in an increasingly technological world. Now, uh, I'm going to say a few words about Norm, and I don't want to spend too much of his time uh, talking myself, but I would like to say just a couple of things about the center and its goals uh, before we uh, move on to Norm's talk. Uh, so the, the center is really responding to some questions that we uh, ask uh, as engineering faculty all the time. One is, uh, how do we best prepare students to lead uh, and thrive in a world uh, in which technology increasingly uh, affects their lives, uh, the way they learn, uh, and society in general? Uh, another is, how do we help students understand how technology is used uh, and can be used to improve uh, society and to improve the world. Now, two of the, the center has many uh, uh, activities that are addressing these issues, but two of the things that we're addressing, uh, two of the issues that we're addressing have to do with uh, how we, our students are, are learn to engage the real world. One is to expose our students to more uh, projects that are real world, that is, uh, engineering problems that don't necessarily have uh, problems that can be looked up in the back, uh, answers that can be looked up in the back of the book, for example. Uh, so these projects typically and increasingly in today's society involve multiple perspectives, that is, they're interdisciplinary. Uh, and on the other hand, they might lead to big solutions to important problems in fields like health care and environment and so forth. Uh, another way that we are addressing these needs uh, is to expose students to uh, real leaders, okay? And that's really what this seminar series is about, leaders who understand uh, technology, uh, great leaders, leaders with courage to uh, tell the world what needs to be done to, uh, to move forward in technological fields. Uh, and uh, the sort of theme of this uh, seminar series is very much like the sort of Princeton's informal motto, which is uh, Princeton in the nation's service and in the nation uh, and the service of all nations. Uh, so uh, that's a nice segue to today's speaker, uh, Norm Augustine, who is certainly uh, revered in these halls as just such a leader. Uh, Norm is uh, one of the great leaders recognized not only by us, but by, by all of the the nation and certainly by much of the world. Uh, he's held high-level posts in government, private industry, academia, and volunteer organizations. Uh, he spent, started his career as an engineer in the aerospace industry, spent about two decades in the aerospace industry uh, in, in engineering jobs, he also in government as Undersecretary of the Army, uh, after which he joined Martin Marietta, which is now uh, part of Lockheed Martin, uh, where he eventually became uh, president, CEO, and chairman. Uh, and I think he was responsible largely for Martin becoming Lockheed Martin. <laughs> After he retired, and I will definitely use quotes, uh, he came to Princeton and spent two years on the faculty teaching in the School of Engineering. Uh, he taught a very popular course and still widely lauded, I should say, uh, for undergraduates, both engineer, engineering and liberal arts students, uh, on the practice of engineering and industry and the management of high technology enterprises. And this course uh, brought in a number of different issues, of course, that come into such uh, 
considerations, for example, ethical considerations and the like. Uh, in, in a way, this, so as I said, this course was very highly uh, thought of here among the faculty, and, and certainly I would, I would date to that course sort of the genesis of the ideas that eventually led to the center because you've got the faculty here thinking about the need to teach these kinds of things. Um, in addition to his uh, career in industry and government, Norm, since he retired, uh, has served on many, served many nonprofit organizations, including Princeton. Uh, he uh, has been chairman and principal officer of the American Red Cross, president of the Boy Scouts of America, chairman of the National Academy of Engineering, president of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, chairman of the Defense Science Board, and trustee of MIT, Johns Hopkins, and, and as I said, Princeton. Uh, he's also been a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Uh, Norm uh, was presented the National Medal of Technology by the President of the United States, and five times has been awarded the Department of Defense's highest civilian decoration, the Distinguished Service Medal. Uh, he's the author of numerous books. I don't know where you find the time, Norm, uh, including uh, the perhaps most famously known, uh, his most well-known book, Augustine's Laws. Uh, of course, such an distinguished person is a graduate of Princeton University. Uh, Norm graduated with a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering, magna cum laude, and also a master's degree in uh, the sa in same field. Uh, in 1995, Norm received the James Madison Medal, which of course is the highest honor that Princeton bestows on uh, its uh, graduate alums. Just recently, uh, the National Academy of Sciences selected Norm to receive the 2006 Public Welfare Medal, which is the National Academy of Sciences' highest uh, honor. Uh, the medal, uh, and I'll cite, I'll quote from the, cite, the uh, citation here, the medal honors Norm's contributions to the vitality of science in the United States by bringing to industry and government a better understanding of the crucial role that fundamental research must play in our long-term security and economic prosperity. Uh, the chair of the selection committee for this award uh, hailed Norm as an effective advocate for wise, long-range policies in the mostly short-range world of wa Washington policymaking. Uh, he called Norm a talented leader with the ability to cut through complex issues quickly and bring diverse groups of people together to focus on getting results. Uh, and I think with that resume, we, we are certainly convinced of Norm's ability to get results. So, Norm... Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, please join me. In well, thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be back with you all. Uh, I, of course, love this place, and it's a treat to uh, be able to join you. That introduction was so generous that, uh, candidly, I didn't recognize myself. Uh, I, I always under that circumstance, think of the introduction that my friend David Roderick once received uh, when David was uh, chairman of U.S. Steel. And the person who introduced David uh, uh, said that David was one of America's most gifted business persons. And to prove it, they cited just one very simple fact. The person who introduced him said that David had made uh, uh, $10 million in California oil. And David came up to the podium, and he was obviously somewhat uh, embarrassed, and he said that the introduction had been generally true, accurate, but he said it actually it had not been California, it was Pennsylvania, and uh, actually it wasn't uh, oil, it was coal, and uh, truthfully it wasn't 10 million, it was 10,000, <laughs> and it wasn't he, it was his brother, <laughs> and he didn't make it, he lost it, so I can relate to this a, a little bit, and uh, I also would have to say that not everyone holds that kind of view that the dean holds or shared with you. Uh, when I uh, wrote my first book, I got a letter from Lawrence Peter, you know, the Peter principal, and I've never met Mr. Peter, but I have this letter framed, which I treasure, and he wrote to me, and he said that he had been studying my career, and that I'd undermined his entire life's work, that I'd risen not one, but two levels above my level of competence. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I don't know about all that, but anyway, it's nice to be here. Uh, as the inaugural lecturer, I guess, in this series, I've been asked to take a rather general overview of leadership, uh, uh, not strictly in engineering, but 
leadership as a whole. And I'm going to draw on a lot of engineering backgrounds because that's my love, of course, is, is engineering. But uh, I'll try to provide kind of a basis for the speakers who will follow uh, with more specific issues in engineering. Uh, let me begin with a, a, a pop quiz here and ask you, uh, in this photo, do you see any uh, leaders here? Uh, would you invest uh, in, in these people? And uh, my answer would be that I hope you would, uh, because those are the people who founded the Microsoft Corporation. And you may also uh, be wondering about the fellow at the bottom left there. Uh, he's probably somebody you've heard of. Now, I cite this uh, because uh, uh, remember Louis Armstrong once uh, was asked, what is jazz? And he said, you'll know it when you hear it. Uh, I would submit with leadership, uh, you don't necessarily know it when you see it in advance, but you'll sure recognize it when you see it in action. And indeed, we've seen these folks in action. Uh, I've noted that there are many different styles of leadership, uh, of styles of leaders. They come in different packaging, if you will. Uh, if you compare the, the style, for example, if you take the military of Omar Bradley on the one hand, the soldier's soldier. George Patton, on the other hand, or in coaching, you, you take the old-time Vince Lombardi uh, versus uh, some of today's uh, more modern coaches, uh, or in business, uh, a Jack Welch versus a Bill Marriott of Marriott Hotels. Totally different kinds of people, but great leaders, every one of them. Uh, one of the best tests that uh, I'm aware of of leadership is how the leader acts in difficult times. Uh, there's a Swedish proverb that says that every, every ship has a great captain in calm waters. Uh, I think that's true of leadership. Uh, you don't really know how good a leader is until you are in a storm. The, uh, uh, one of the truly great leaders, in, in my judgment, in history, is, has been this gentleman. I cite this to make a point uh, that leadership is not a popularity contest. Uh, in the, uh, high schools electing the senior class president uh, may have more to do with a popularity contest than with leadership. Here was a, a, a gentleman who, in my opinion, was a world-class leader. And you recall that right after his greatest accomplishment, his own people threw him out of office. Uh, so you're not uh, in this uh, to make everyone necessarily happy. Uh, one thing that's... Uh, Certainly true of leadership, though, is that one person could make an enormous difference, even in a very large organization. Let me cite to you the case of uh, a gentleman by the name of A.G. Lafley, uh, one of the nicest people you've ever meet, will ever meet, <coughs> excuse me, and also one of the uh, world's great leaders, in my opinion, certainly in the business world. Uh, See if I can figure out how to fire this thing here. I got it. Uh, I didn't even injure myself. Uh, AG is uh, CEO, chairman and CEO of, of uh, Procter & Gamble. Uh, I've served on their board 18 years now. And uh, this is taken out of Financial Times, the publication. And uh, this is a plot of uh, P&G stock price for a period of time. Uh, at this point, the board put a new CEO in place, not AG, and this is what happened. We changed only one person in the company. Uh, at this point, the board decided we need a new CEO. We put AG in the job, and that's the only change we made was that one person, and this is what happened to their stock price, and if you extrapolate that out to today, the point is about here, uh, after splits. Uh, he would be the first person to tell you that he didn't do it alone. He didn't even begin to do it alone. But as a great leader, he created an environment where everybody could excel and make the maximum contribution they were capable of. There's also the flip side to this, and that is that one person can ruin even a very large organization. Uh, I'm certainly, uh, you, maybe you can guess who I'm talking about here. Uh, Mr. Owens of the Philadelphia Eagles that were in the Super Bowl in uh, 2004. And in 2005, they didn't even make the playoffs. And many people attribute the problem 
uh, to uh, Mr. Owen's contribution, if you will, to the team. Let me raise four tough questions about leadership. Uh, uh, I think these are particularly difficult ones. One, what is leadership? Uh, another is, can leadership be taught? Uh, and you can read these. Uh, what is leadership? I'll talk about that a little bit. Can leadership be taught or are leaders born? Uh, I guess you wouldn't be here if you didn't think it could be taught. Uh, I'm not so sure it could be taught, but I'm sure it could be learned. And I think the distinction is that I think you can learn by studying leaders, by studying CAPE studies, and be, by being immersed into situations where you have to lead, even on a small scale. Uh, I think you could certainly learn leadership. Uh, the ingredients of leadership, that's what I'm going to spend most of my time on today. And then there's that question, can one be a leader if your cause is unworthy? If you're Adolf Hitler or Osama bin Laden or uh, Pol Pot or someone, uh, if you lead through intimidation, then that's not leadership. Uh, uh, or if you lead through fear. But uh, there are people who follow Osama bin Laden uh, voluntarily because they apparently believe in what he's doing. Uh, does that make him a great leader? I happen to think not. I think you have to do great things to be a great leader. But that's a question that's always puzzled me, and I, I'll throw that out there. Uh, what then uh, is leadership? Uh, I looked leadership up. I've always been interested in leadership for recent years. And I looked up in the dictionary the definition of a leader. And if you do that, the first definition you'll come across says uh, a short piece of cat gut. This is not too helpful unless you're a fisherman. Uh, if you look further, you find better definitions. The one I like the best, uh, uh, or one of the ones I like the best, uh, was from General Eisenhower, who uh, called leadership the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because they want to do it. So leadership involves getting something done by other people because they want to. Uh, that's not to say that leaders can't be demanding or tough. Uh, they often are. Uh, think of the football coach Vince Lombardi. Uh, I could, uh, he, he once told his team that, uh, that I quote, anyone who is not fired with enthusiasm will be fired with enthusiasm. Uh, <laughs> and as a matter of fact, when Tom Ridge became head of the new Department of Homeland Security and asked me for my advice, that's what I gave him. Uh, but let me share with you my 14-word uh, summary saves you three years in business school, uh, of what is management. In my mind, uh, this is what I think uh, it takes to be a good manager. Uh, but leadership is more than management. Uh, it's been said that uh, uh, management is the art of getting things done right. Leadership is the art of getting the right things done. And so we want to go beyond mere management and talk about leadership. Uh, by far the best definition of leadership I've ever seen comes from a tombstone. It's a tombstone uh, in Normandy from a British uh, Army officer's uh, grave. And inscribed on it, it says, leadership is wisdom and courage and carelessness of self. But if that's leadership, uh, it's also useful to ask the definition of what is leadership? What is failed leadership? To that, I borrowed the cover from Fortune magazine in which they put the pictures of CEOs uh, on it that they viewed as failed leaders. Uh, many of these people are friends of mine. Uh, they're all decent people. They're many of them very smart people. Uh, Fortune nonetheless deemed them to be failed leaders. Uh, what did they have in common? Uh, it's essentially the opposite things to those that we're going to describe that I have found that leaders have in common. I've learned that uh, early in a person's career, if they fail as a leader, it's usually because they didn't have the skills it takes to get the particular task done that they were pursuing. Uh, in other words, they were an engineer that didn't understand the second law of thermodynamics. They were a uh, lawyer that didn't understand uh, uh, the Constitution. They were an accountant that didn't understand accounting principles. Uh, in the middle of a career, those leaders that I've seen fail it was usually because they became too interested in their, themselves. And at the higher levels of a career, later in a career, the failures I've noted, usually from two things. One is hubris, and the other is a lack of people skills. 
Uh, I took from uh, six organizations, Fortune 100 companies, I happen to have some inside knowledge of, uh, their lists of what they look for when they put a new CEO in place. And I combined those six lists and took out some of the redundancies and came up with a list shown here of what these companies look for when they try to pick their very top leaders. This is too many items to deal with, so I have boiled these down somewhat, and I'm going to talk about them in the boiled down version. I did notice, though, uh, and I think this is important, it's not intuitively obvious to me, that one's likelihood to succeed uh, in a leadership role is not dependent upon your average, the average of your attributes that are important on that list, uh, nor is it dependent upon what you're the very best at on that list. It's dependent on how strong is the weakest of your attributes. And so, uh, unlike most people who uh, say are shooting baskets in basketball, uh, I know I always like to practice the shot I was best at because I could make the ball go through the hoop and it was fun. You ought to practice the thing you're not good at. And uh, somehow that subtly escapes us. Uh, the primary attribute, uh, or before I say that, let me give you a little more background. Uh, when I got interested in the topic of leadership, uh, I made a list of about 30 people that I've known personally that I thought were great leaders. Uh, many of them were fairly famous people. I've been lucky to get to know a lot of these folks. Some of the people that uh, no one in this room, probably other than myself, has ever even heard of. I listed these people, and then I wrote beside their name, one by one, what was it that made me think they were great leaders? Why, what was it about them? And then I tried to look for patterns. And indeed, I found a pattern that they had certain common ingredients. And in the rest of this lecture, I'd like to talk about those common ingredients that I found from these 30 people that I considered to be great leaders. Uh, the first of those common ingredients uh, was that they were people of character. They had a moral compass. They were ethical people. Uh, that's fairly obvious. I mean, who's going to follow somebody you can't trust? Uh, people without integrity are not likely to be successful as a leader. Uh, sometimes uh, issues of integrity are fairly easy to deal with. For example, uh, the company that I was leading, we one time were in a a competition with another company, the Rockwell Company, and uh, we each were to submit our bid the following day uh, for, a, for a piece of work, uh, a fixed price bid. And in our mail arrived a, an envelope uh, without a return address that it turned out had been sent to us by a disgruntled employee from our competitor, and in it was a copy of the bid sheet that the competitor was going to submit the next day. That kind of issue is easy to deal with. Uh, uh, but uh, sometimes the issues aren't easy like that. And let me give you an example of a harder one. And for that, I come to Johnson & Johnson and their prime product at the time this occurred, Tylenol. Some years ago, there were a series of murders. Uh, seven people died. I think it was in the Chicago area from taking Tylenol capsules that somebody had gone into the stores, opened the bottles, sold them with poison, the capsules with poison, put them back on the shelves, people bought them, took the Tylenol and died. Uh, the question that was posed to the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, Jim Burke, was uh, do we recall all the Tylenol capsules uh, in the world uh, because there may be danger to our customers? Uh, his lawyers uh, said, you have no responsibility for this. You build perfectly good Tylenol capsules you sell them, the stores put them on the shelf, and how could you be responsible for what people do with the capsules uh, after you've uh, made perfectly good capsules? Uh, many argued against a recall. They said it would destroy the company, it would undermine the Tylenol brand, people would be afraid to take it, draw a lot of attention to the company that they didn't want. Uh, Jim's decision was to recall 31 million bottles of Tylenol from the shelves around the country cost them a big piece of, uh, of their uh, market cap, cost them a lot of market share, uh, cost them $100 million in earnings that year, their stock price dropped. Uh, but today, when people talk about ethical companies, after all these years, Johnson & Johnson almost always comes up as an example. 
in a very positive sense. And Jim said that he had no choice. Uh, he had been talking for this entire time as leader of that company about we care about our customers. And he said there was really, I didn't have anything to think about. He said, after having spent all that time talking about it, I was forced to put my customers first and to recall all those bottles, which he did. Uh, the uh, President Reagan once commented, and let me quote, the character that takes command in moments of crucial choices has already been determined by a thousand other choices made in seemingly unimportant moments. By all those times when the voice of conscience was at war with the voice of temptation. Uh, a very good summary of the Tylenol case. Another example uh, in this regard comes from uh, Herb Craner. Uh, Herb Craner was a mid to high level employee in a container corporation. Uh, what, he was doing very well, rising up with the company. One day the chairman came to him and said that he'd noticed uh, Craner's contribution. He'd been very impressed with it. And he said to Cranert that uh, he was going to nominate Cranert to serve on the corporation's board of directors. Cranert was very flattered. He was absolutely thrilled about it until he heard the next line uh, from the chairman. The chairman said, but in every issue, you will vote as I tell you. Well, Cranert thought about that for a minute, and he answered with two words. He said, I quit. And indeed, he quit. The next day, he was at home, uh, but the doorbell rang. And on the porch of his house were six of his colleagues at work. They said to him that they had heard what had happened that day, and that they didn't want to work for a company that operated in that fashion. And they said, so we quit too. And uh, they said, we're here because we'd like to go to work for you. You're the kind of person we'd like to work for. And Craner said, well, you know, there's a little bit of a problem. I'm sitting here. I don't have a job. How can I offer you, you jobs? And they said, well, we realize that, but we thought maybe we could sit down and together come up with something that you could start a company. We'd all work for you. So they sat down in Craner's living room. That afternoon, they came up with the idea for what today is Inland Containers, a very large corporation uh, that uh, sprouted because of Craner's uh, position. The lack of character and leadership can, of course, be disastrous, and it can be disastrous very quickly. Uh, here is uh, Fortune's ranking of the most honored companies, most admired companies in the energy uh, business in February of 2001. Here is Fortune's cover 10 months later. Uh, there's only one kind of failure, I think, in, in business and in life that you, you can't recover from, and that's an ethical fa failure. Uh, companies, although they could terribly damaged, as we've seen, can sometimes recover because they can cut out the piece that caused the problem. Uh, we don't have that choice as humans. Uh, and in fact, I, I'm sad, sad to say I've had six friends who've gone to jail. All of them were basically good people, made one huge ethical error. These were very successful people. Several of them worked in the White House, several were CEOs, uh, and so on. And it wasn't that they went out and said, I'm going to really do something wrong. They made one small error and stepped out on that slippery slope and then tried to cover up that error and cover up that error until eventually they dug themselves a hole that they couldn't get out of. So that's the first quality of my group of, C of uh, people I admire. Incidentally, they weren't all CEOs. There were people from politics, sports, uh, medicine, law, uh, engineering, and so on. The second uh, was they tend to have very good vision. A uh, view of their surroundings, of what's possible, even of what's likely to happen in the future. Uh, Jack Welch calls this the ability to see around corners. Uh, whoever wrote this headline in January 1st, 1929, didn't have vision that I was talking about. Alexander Graham Bell uh, offered to Western Union, a huge successful company at the time, the patent to the newfound idea, the telephone. He offered them the patent for $100,000. And I have a copy of a, uh, a memo in Western, from Western Union's files that said that they had turned Alexander Graham Bell down uh, because they couldn't understand why a telephone would be of any use when you could communicate with Morse code. Uh, that's a lack of vision in leadership. Let me give you a case that I had a 
major personal interest in the uh, outcome of. Uh, the second time I left the government, uh, I was debating between joining uh, two companies, one of two companies. Uh, one was uh, at that time called Martin, well, actually it was uh, Martin Marietta, Martin Aerospace, and the other was Fairchild. At that time, both companies were about two billion, about a billion dollars a year in sales. Uh, both companies had their headquarters about three miles apart in Maryland. Both companies were in the aerospace business, and ironically, both companies' uh, CEO had been trained at, uh, at the Martin Company. They had come out of that company. Uh, at that time, a major decision had to be made because it looked like there were too many companies in the airplane business. They were both in the airplane business. Uh, the leadership at Fairchild decided to stay in the air airplane business. The leadership of uh, Martin decided that they were going to have to do something new of going to electronics and space. Well, as a result, in part from those decisions, that was certainly the fundamental one. This was the history of uh, the annual sales of uh, what then was uh, Heritage Martin, and this is the Fairchild one. Happily, I joined, decided to join the yellow curve uh, for my career. But it shows the difference that can come out uh, from the lack of, uh, of foresight. One of the toughest periods I encountered in, in my career, and in, in the business world anyway, was uh, shortly after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, it became apparent that the U.S. aerospace industry was hugely uh, oversized. And in fact, as it turned out, within the next five years, 40% uh, of our employees and 75% of the companies in the industry were gone. They were out of the industry, or they didn't ex in the case of the companies, uh, they no longer existed. Uh, when we used to have uh, uh, meetings, strategy meetings during that period, to try to figure out what we should do, uh, I often begin with this chart uh, from Woody Allen that says, more than any other time in history, we face a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. Uh, that truly was the way I felt at the time. Uh, we adopted a strategy which was to buy other companies, uh, get rid of the redundant parts, uh, downsize, and try to become very efficient and to have a critical mass. Uh, as a result of that, cr that strategy, we combined all our parts of 17 different companies shown here. Uh, many of them, we took, bought the aerospace parts of them and uh, built what today is Lockheed Martin. Uh, so certainly vision of having a decent strategy is important, uh, or the ability to see, the, what, see, the, see your surroundings. Uh, the third ingredient I found in this group I studied was they had basic competence in the fields in which they were dealing. Uh, they didn't have to be expert in every field, but they had enough basic competence in one field that they understood it, and enough general background that they could at least discuss, right, ask the right questions in other fields. A competence relates, of course, to everyday matters like this. Uh, that's not competence, whoever loaded that. Uh, but also to bigger matters. Uh, for example, uh, this is a telescope that was located in West Virginia. It's trainable. Uh, it was larger than a, a football field, substantially larger than a football field. It uh, included in it um, uh, thousands of brackets. Uh, one bracket in a particularly critical place, uh, single point failure mode, uh, that bracket was under design. Uh, the consequence was that. Uh, an example of a lack of competence bringing down a large uh, uh, structure, if you will. Uh, you remember when Michael Jordan was viewed as such a great leader, but you'll also recall that when he played minor league baseball, he wasn't viewed as a leader even of his own minor league team. Uh, in basketball, there was probably as, he was as great a leader and certainly as great a player as you'll find. Uh, Suggesting that uh, it's important to know something uh, or to be exceptional at uh, the things you're, you're dealing with. Uh, the fourth ingredient I found had to do with judgment. Uh, to be able to weigh issues, complex issues, and make sound judgments. Uh, the Titanic was designed to carry 2,224 passengers and crew members. 
it was considered unsinkable. Uh, therefore, they put 1,178 lifeboat positions on the ship. Uh, now, certainly one possible judgment would have been by the designers that this is an unsinkable ship, and so we don't need any lifeboat positions. Another possibility would be to say this ship is sinkable, and we need uh, at least enough positions for everybody on board the ship. Uh, there's no judgment that I could think of that would permit you to conclude you need half as many uh, lifeboat positions as there are on the ship. Uh, I guess you'd have to think that the ship was going to half sink or it was half sinkable or something. Uh, we all know the sad outcome uh, of that, that in 1912 on the maiden voyage, 1,515 people lost their lives. So good judgment usually applies uh, setting aside uh, uh, personal biases, setting aside emotion, and making the really tough decision. There's that great Kenny Rogers song about the gambler that says that uh, you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Uh, a more recent example of, of I think, bad judgment. Uh, you may recall not all that many years ago, uh, Ford and Firestone were having a problem with the Firestone tires, which were blamed for rollover, rollovers of the Explorer made by the Ford, made by Ford. The Congress uh, in Washington got interested in this and asked the CEO of Ford uh, to come to a hearing on the subject. Uh, Ford put out a press release, and I'll quote from it, Ford said yesterday that President Jacques Nasser is too busy with the recall to testify at the House hearing or another one scheduled by the Senate committee. So he was too busy to go to Washington and testify. He overlooked one detail, and that is that the Senate and the House have another way to invite you to testify. It's, it's known as a subpoena. And a few days later, there they all were with their hands in the air, uh, being sworn in, and now they're in front of a very hostile Congress. Uh, under such circumstances, uh, the advice once given to me by Warren Buffett is awfully good for a leader. Uh, Warren told me, when you have a crisis, tell the truth and tell it fast. Uh, unfortunately, they, uh, in this case, uh, didn't follow that, even though they held positions of great leadership. Just as an aside, I'll share with you a story uh, that occurred to me uh, in our company. Uh, one of the relatively senior person in the company had done something that they shouldn't have done. They weren't very proud of it. We weren't proud of it at all. Uh, it wasn't illegal, but it was clearly wrong. And uh, John Dingle, the congressman who ran the Surveys and Investigations Committee, a very tough guy, decided to have a hearing, and since I was CEO, I was going to get to be the star witness, something I wasn't particularly looking forward to. And so I went to see him about two weeks before the hearing. And I told him, I said, uh, you know, the facts your staff has gathered are true, what you think really did happen. And I said, furthermore, we hired an outside law firm to investigate this, and it turns out you don't have the whole story. There's more to it. And it's even worse when you hear the whole story. And I told him the rest of the story. I said, uh, we're embarrassed by this. This is what we've done to the individual involved. This is what we've done to the process to make sure this can't happen again. And we apologize. I'm very sure that it won't happen again in our country, company. And he looked at me kind of quizzically, and he said, this is no fun. <laughs> and he said, how am I going to have a hearing if you're going to do that? And he said, I've got to drag this out of you in front of the TV cameras. And there never was a hearing. He called the whole thing off. Uh, sometimes the best or always, I think the best way to deal with issues as a leader is to get them out in the open and get them over with. Courage, the fifth ingredient. Uh, this is an advertisement placed by Ernest Shackleton, uh, the explorer in a London newspaper in about 1900. And pardon the sexist nature of it, but uh, he had over 5,000 people sign up to go with him as a result of that ad. Uh, and as you all know, uh, his ship was crushed uh, in the ice uh, off the coast of Antarctica. And uh, he sailed with a couple other members of the crew in a small boat uh, across the open ocean, managed to navigate to a tiny island, climbed up over a mountain range, slid down the mountain range, went and got another boat, went back, and saved his entire crew of 28, including himself, in a trip that took two and a half years uh, altogether. Uh, that's courage. Uh, one of the reasons courage is necessary is that leaders are often called upon to take risks. And 
certainly if uh, you're going to build great edifices, uh, you probably do have to take risks. I'm not talking about irrational risks. I'm talking about considered risks, uh, prudent risks. Uh, oh, there's his boat in it, stuck in the ice. Uh, these people are building a great edifice. In my book, they're taking a great risk, uh, but it goes with a job. But when a leader takes a risk, one of the things they can do is uh, seek to ameliorate the risks. Uh, and here my favorite example of trying to control a risk uh, comes from the aerospace world. Uh, these are some fellows who designed an airplane that apparently had a roll stability problem. And uh, they found a way to deal with that. Uh, let me give you a, a business risk uh, that, I th or that I thought showed great courage on the part of the person who dealt with it. Uh, the person who dealt with this risk was my predecessor, uh, Tom Pownall, the CEO of uh, Martin Marietta. Uh, one day, much to our surprise, uh, we discovered that uh, the Bendix Corporation had decided to take over our company in a hostile takeover. Uh, Bill Agee was uh, CEO of Bendix. Uh, hostile takeovers in business are the business equivalent of nuclear war, but without the dignity. Uh, pretty ugly affairs. Uh, Bendix struck first and quickly, and they owned 72% of our stock. So they owned our company. They, they had bought us. Uh, Tom, though, being a very courageous guy, uh, said, you know, before they can come in here and stop us, we'll get our board together and we'll buy their company. Uh, we all kind of thought, well, that's crazy. But Tom said, that's what we're going to do. And so we got the board together and we bought a majority of Bendix's stock. So now we own each other. <laughs> you may recall the TV called this the Pac-Man defense after the little Pac-Man. Uh, this led to some very interesting issues. For example, uh, we were competitors with each other, Bendix and ourselves. And uh, the problem was that uh, since we owned them, uh, when we competed with each other, we wanted them to win. We wanted to lose because we got their profits. And the problem was, though, that they wanted to lose because they owed us and wanted to get our profits. And a whole new concept in competing where you both are trying to lose. <laughs> in any event, uh, we went to Bendix and sat down at the table and said, okay, you own us, but guess what? We now own you. What are you going to do about it? And uh, we sued each other in 34 courts, and I won't drag you through that. The eventual outcome was that uh, Bendix ceased to exist. Uh, we took on a huge amount of debt, but we survived. And later, uh, the company became a part of Lockheed Martin. That I would describe as not just courage. I would call that audacity as well. And here is audacity. Uh, great leaders, this is my sixth item, uh, listen to advice. Uh, this picture, of course, you'll recall from the Space Shuttle Challenger when it uh, failed. Uh, this is an unfortunate example of what happens when management uh, doesn't listen. Uh, the launch began in such a promising fashion and ended in disaster. But it turned out that there had been a large number of people and a lot of signals uh, that this was likely to end in disaster. And there were all kinds of engineering documents in the file. Uh, one of them said, we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight along with all the launch pad facilities. Another engineering memo began with the word HELP in capital letters. Not something you often see in engineering technical reports. And sadly, a better engineering uh, analysis of the flight prior flight data about the seals on the solid rocket motors would have proven fairly conclusively that this was going to fail uh, before it was ever launched. Uh, the data was presented the night before the launch to the people who had to make the decision, but uh, frankly, it was presented in such a confusing fashion uh, that the wrong decision was made. And uh, uh, the leaders didn't listen to the engineers. And at the various levels of management, the people weren't listening uh, to what was being said. Uh, one of my favorite stories about listening has to do with uh, Casey Jones, the coach of the Celtics some years ago. Uh, he was a rookie coach. And one of his, he had played for the Celts. And of course, his most famous teammate at the time was a guy by the name of Larry Bird. Uh, and in the, one of the first games that uh, uh, Jones, now a coach, uh, is coaching, uh, there's just a few seconds left. The Celtics are behind by one point. 
And uh, he calls timeout, gathers his team around, gets out his clipboard, and starts drawing up the play they're going to run. And Bird, you can see, is getting impatient, finally interrupts. And he said, look, why don't you cut out all that X's and O's nonsense? He said, just get the ball to me, and let's get the hell out of here and win this thing. And uh, Casey Jones could see as a brand-new coach, I mean, he was really being challenged. He said he could see his whole coaching career going past him in terms of did he, what was he going to do in the next 10 seconds. And so he looked at the team in the eye, stared at each other, and he said, let me make one thing very clear. He said, there's only one coach on this team, and that's me. He said, I will decide what we will do, and everyone will do it. Is that clear? And he said, now let me tell you what we're going to do. He said, we're going to get the ball to Bird and win this thing and get the hell out of here. <laughs> Good example of listening. Another example, this is the... Uh, uh, famous Vasa sailing sh ship from Sweden, uh, built in 1628. This is not a new problem of not listening. Uh, the king, on one of his trips abroad, the uh, king of Sweden, noticed that there were other countries building ships with more cannon than were going on this new ship, the Vasa, that he was having built. So he went to the naval architect and said, put another deck on top of it and put a bunch of cannon on it. Well, the naval architect uh, knew that wasn't too grand an idea. But, uh, I mean, this is the king telling him what to do. So he said nothing. Uh, they had a big celebration the day the ship was finished. There were bands. All the people from Stockholm gathered around the harbor. The ship went down the ways, out in the Stockholm harbor, went 200 yards, rolled over, and sunk. It was underwater for 300 years until they dug it up about 40 years ago. Uh, the king, uh, they then... Uh, uh, created an investigation team, as they would today, to find out what went wrong. Now, supposing you're ahead of this investigation team and you've got to tell the king what went wrong. Uh, if you read the report of that team, it's very short, and it makes only one recommendation. And the recommendation is move the Naval Design Bureau out of the castle, uh, where the king can't interfere in so many words. Uh, when I had the great pleasure of uh, coming to teach here, the morning before... Uh, my first day uh, on the faculty, I happened to have breakfast with Warren Buffett, and I asked Warren, what is the most important thing that I can teach my students based on your experience in life? And his answer was, uh, teach them to always have someone around who will tell the emperor he has no clothes. Uh, having someone around like that and listening to them is enormously important. And failure to listen uh, takes various forms. Uh, hubris uh, has a big impact here, too. Uh, take the case of the Hubble Space Telescope, which was built by Lockheed. Uh, we expected to get pictures uh, back from space that looked like that. As you may recall, the first ones came back looking like that. Uh, as you could, may also recall, the media referred to it as the nearsighted Mr. Magoo. Uh, and trouble with Hubble, they, they had a grand time playing with this. Uh, it turned out that... Uh, Perkin Elmer, which was probably the best optical manufacturer in America at the time, uh, had built the primary mirror for this telescope. And uh, they had designed a test after the mirror had been constructed to verify that uh, it indeed had the proper contour. Uh, the test they designed should produce patterns like this, uh, optical interference patterns. And uh, when they ran the test, they got this instead. Uh, they worked backwards and determined that it would take a 1.2 millimeter error, not angstroms, millimeters, uh, for a mirror to be that bad. Well, they said to themselves, we're the best manufacturers of mirrors in America. We couldn't, I mean, you don't make 1.2 millimeter errors uh, building mirrors. And so they said that there must be something wrong with the test. They designed another test that was supposed to produce this pattern. Uh, they ran a different kind of test, and they got this. Once again, it said there was a 1.2 millimeter error. They said, you know, something wrong with the testing world because we're too good to have this. So they shipped the mirror to us, we put it on the space telescope, and we launched it. And uh, that's the reason we got fuzzy pictures. Happily, in this case, unlike most cases in aerospace, uh, we got a do-over. Aerospace isn't like Detroit where you have recalls. Uh, in this case, we were able to... Uh, put a corrective lens, uh, as you know, uh, take it up on the space shuttle and put it on the Hubble uh, to correct the error uh, of 1.2 millimeters and uh, began getting pictures like uh, this one of Serpens. Uh, that pillar there 
on the left is six trillion miles tall. Uh, the seventh ingredient that I found among the leaders I studied was one of decisiveness. Now, here's real decisiveness. Uh, there's only one problem, and that is you also have to be correct when you're decisive. And decisiveness is dangerous. Uh, I've had the misfortune in my recent years uh, to have to tell two CEOs of Fortune 100 companies that their services were no longer needed. One of them was because he couldn't pull the trigger. He just would get right up to the moment of making a decision and just couldn't pull the trigger. The other one was known as ready, fire, aim. Uh, both disastrous. Uh, you need the judgment somewhere in the middle. Uh, one unfortunate conclusion of all this uh, about making decisions and decisiveness if you're a leader is that very rarely do you have complete knowledge. Uh, usually there's uncertainty. Often there's conflicting information uh, with very good arguments uh, on all sides. And uh, that's what makes uh, leadership very often difficult. Let me give you an example from my career. This was a uh, titanium foundry that our company operated uh, in Torrance, California. I was visiting there one day, and uh, in one part of the factory, there was a sign, a big sign on the wall that said, no eating, no food in this area, uh, lead. And I wasn't very happy about that, and so I checked with the guy who ran the, the plant. And uh, it, it became quite clear we were not violating OSHA laws, we were violating no regulations, but that since there was lead in the process, it wasn't safe to have food around. Well, I wasn't too happy about that. So I asked the guy who ran the plant, I said, what can we do to get the lead out of this process? He said, there's no way. He said, well, we've tried for 30 years, and it takes lead. Uh, it acts sort of as a lubricant. It was for extrusions. And he said, uh, there's no way it takes lead. Well, I got back to the headquarters, and I called a guy who was in charge of our environmental work. And he was a guy who had spent his life launching space launch vehicles, which is very unforgiving. Uh, I mean, when you blow those things up, you don't get to start over. Uh, and he'd been put in the environmental job just because he was very demanding and very tough. Anyway, I got him into my office, and I, I said, Chuck, the, uh, we've got a problem in Torrance, and they've got lead in this process. Would you look at it and see if you could do anything to get the lead out of that process out there? And they say it's hard. And he, said, he looked at me and said, well, I can get that out of there in six weeks. And I said, you can? How would you do that? He said, I'll show you. And he took the phone off my desk, and he proceeds to call the plant manager out there. And he gets the plant manager on the phone, and he said, uh, I'm sitting here talking to Norm, and he just told me that if you don't have the lead out of that process out there, he's going to close your plant in six weeks. <laughs> that would never have occurred to me. Uh, that's not my management style. I mean, I, I'm not fond of that style, to be honest. Uh, but I must tell you, six weeks later, there was no lead in the process. Uh, it worked just fine. It was safe. And we actually have reduced the cost a little teeny bit. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of arbitrariness that you've got to make the decision before you have all the data. And uh, uh, particularly when you're trying to change something, uh, it's not always easy to adapt to change. <laughs> and uh, as, as I mentioned, if... You, you certainly need a strategy for dealing with change and with these issues. And here I want to share with you uh, one of my favorite examples of strategy. Uh, this is from my friend Kent Cressa, who ran uh, Northrop Grumman. Uh, CEO Kent, this is, I'm reading the brown part. CEO Kent Cressa also said, Northrop will continue to sell non-productive assets. Last year it sold its headquarters in Los Angeles. <laughs> now that, that is decisive. I mean, that's decisiveness. Uh, next ingredient, motivation. Uh, I, I've always said that motivation will almost always beat sheer talent, and I believe that. Uh, take the, uh, a few years ago, actually when I was teaching here, there was the Princeton-Penn basketball game. Uh, when Princeton, a ball control team, of course, uh, was behind 33-9 to nine against Penn at halftime. Can you imagine 33-9? to nine? Uh, Preston went on to win the game 50 to 49. Or the game in the National Football League playoffs when uh, uh, Buffalo was behind the Oilers by 32 points at halftime. They came back out and Buffalo uh, uh, turned the game around and won in overtime. Now, my question would be 
did Princeton get that much more ability at halftime? Did Buffalo become that much more talented at halftime? I think there must have been something else at work here other than ability and talent. And uh, I would think that was, to a very large degree, uh, something called motivation. Admiral DeMars, who used to run the uh, U.S. Navy's nuclear submarine program, always went down on the first dive of every new, di every, every new submarine when they tested the hull to be sure it wouldn't crush. And I told him, I, th I was, thought that was a pretty admirable thing for him to do, being in charge of the whole program. And he looked at me and said, yeah, you know, I was thinking about uh, uh, how, many of the, how much of these submarines your company builds for us. It would sure be nice if you came along with me. <laughs> uh, that's known as an invitation you can't refuse. But I cite it because I'll tell you, he really motivated me. And uh, I always tried to fly in our new products. Uh, I'm not a pilot. I fly in the back seat. But, uh, you know, they've said that the, the best uh, parachutists are those who pack their own chutes. Uh, and uh, uh, to uh, have, know you're going to fly in these things uh, does motivate you to be sure that you've, you've got it right and haven't cut any corners. Uh, we used to build, a, or we still do, build the Atlas Space Launch Vehicle. And we had to close the facility in San, in San Diego and move it to Denver. This is a picture of the last vehicle to come down the line. Uh, we had every single person in the factory go up and sign their name on the side of the launch vehicle before we shipped it, uh, because you always worry about the last one before you close a line. Uh, ask them to sign certifying they had done everything they knew to do to make this a success. But the people were very motivated. They were excited about having their name fly into space. And six months later, we launched it very successfully. A very important part of motivation is communication. People can't read your mind. Uh, as you can tell, I love sports. i got a story about this, too. Uh, but one coach who shall go nameless here got unhappy with the referee and he, he called the referee, let's say he called him a jerk. And uh, the referee heard that and went up to him and said, uh, you say something like that again and you're out of here. And so the coach started to walk away and he turned around, went back and chased after the referee. And he said, uh, you couldn't throw me out of here for what I'm thinking, could you? And the ref said, no, I don't suppose I could. And he said, well, I'm thinking that you're a jerk. <laughs> and, <laughs> You've got to tell people uh, what it is you're, you're thinking. They can't read your mind. Incidentally, the ref thought it was funny, fortunately. Uh, whenever we bought another company, we spent the first two weeks, which is a terribly busy time for you, but we'd spend the first two weeks going around talking to our new employees, sometimes in a group of 50, sometimes in uh, this is the plant in Fort Worth. It's a mile long. There are over 5,000 people in that plant that day, asking them questions, uh, answering their questions, uh, telling them what's on our mind. Uh, communication is actually absolutely critical to leadership. Uh, many great examples, Kennedy, uh, Churchill, uh, uh, Henry V, the Agincourt, and so on. Uh, leaders can't send conflicting signals. Uh, what do you think the people in this city thought of the leadership of their city? Uh, you can't blow an uncertain <coughs> trumpet. Uh, here's an example, a true of when we built one Reagan National Airport was built in Washington, D.C., where I live. Uh, there were signs like this. Uh, there were food areas around. Uh, this sign appeared in every food area around the airport. And uh, this was a problem. And in fact, a friend of mine, Jim Symington, I took his picture by one of these signs. He sent it to the Washington Post and said that he was missing all of his flights because he couldn't get through the airport without stopping and having a drink at every spot. <laughs> And if you notice, the signs today have all been changed right after that. Uh, perseverance, and we're nearing the end here, terribly important. Uh, this is from a United Technologies ad, uh, a great example of perseverance and what it takes. Uh, Jack Welch refers to this as, does he get back on his horse? Uh, how do you do when times are tough and when you've uh, suffered? Selflessness, in other words, teamwork, uh, suppressing your own, your own interest for the good of the team. Uh, here's an example of teamwork. Change four tires, fill with gas, give the driver, driver a drink of water in a, a, around 10 seconds. That takes teamwork. Uh, selflessness. Uh, Alexander the Great, when he was leading his army uh, uh, across a barren desert for 11 days, sent foragers out to get water. 
And the story is told that the foragers returned with one canteen of water and said that's all they could find. Alexander the Great is said to have poured the water on the sand and said, uh, 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 there's no value for one person to drink when many are thirsty. Uh, good leaders are always thinking of their troops. Uh, here's a leader with her troops, an example actually of not good leadership. Uh, she was not thinking of her troops. Uh, and there's a little, uh -oh, a little problem here. And it reminds me of uh, the, in most military units, including the British Army, they rate their officers. And one of the officers' efficiency ratings are called had the great quote that said it was by his superior officer, and he wrote, this officer's troops would follow him almost anywhere, mostly out of curiosity. That's not leadership. <laughs> you do need teamwork. Uh, you, it's, you can't have somebody in this formation suddenly decide, you know, I think I'll do a snap roll now and really make the crowd notice me. Uh, that would not be a, a very good idea. Uh, important factor of leadership by uh, selflessness, the reward of command is the opportunity to lead, not to have a bigger tent. Uh, General George Custer said that, and sadly, there are an awful lot of CEOs in America who would do well to have learned that. Uh, two more items. One has to do with mentoring. Most good leaders create other good leaders. Uh, Glenn Martin had founded the company I worked for, had working for him in his early days the founders of almost the entire industry. Uh, and he made one huge mistake, and that was that he taught Bill Bowling to fly. Uh, in sports, uh, you find the same thing. Uh, you find certain leaders that produce many other uh, outstanding leaders. And then twelfth and last is the matter of passion, uh, energy, enthusiasm, the willingness to work and work hard. As Tom Young, who was president of Martin Marietta, used to say, you've got to be willing to slide head first. Uh, because often victories are defined, or the difference between victory and defeat is very small. Uh, uh, in the Indy 500 last year, the person who won, won by 64 one thousandth of a second after racing for 500 miles. Uh, I have a whole collection of examples like that. Uh, it's the person who could draw the most out of themselves and the people around them. So here are the list of 12 attributes that I found, qualities of a leader, whether they're leading a technical project uh, or leading the American Red Cross or a corporation, uh, whatever, uh, they seem to be in common. And if you put all these things together, you could do some truly amazing things with this kind of leadership. Uh, this is a picture of a Liberty ship, a large World War II ocean-going vessel. Uh, the picture, the bo pit boat in this particular picture uh, was special because it was built at the shortest time of any Liberty ship built during World War II. Uh, the time from laying the keel to going down the gangways into the water was four days. Here's a house in San Diego, two-story house, going from a vacant lot to the completed house, landscaped, fully furnished, ready to move in, uh, was two hours and 45 minutes. Uh, I have the video of this, do of doing this. Uh, Great leadership, great planning, great motivation, and with that, you truly can do great things. And so with that, let me thank you very much for your inviting me to be here today. Okay, you like to. Good. Hey, Norm has agreed to take a few questions, so uh, we'll just open it up to the floor here. <coughs> Kind of, uh, would you like to speak to any ethical issues that you yourself face? Yeah, the, the question was, would I care to speak to any ethical issues that I face myself? And you would imagine there would be quite a few. Indeed, there have. Uh, uh, more than you might expect. And uh, I think that's a point I've always tried to make, is that people often don't realize they face ethical issues in life, but uh, they, they do come uh, along periodically. Uh, and certainly one that uh, I would cite was the one I mentioned. It was an easy one when we got the other guy's bid sheet. Uh, what we did was call the other guy and so said, we've got your bid sheet. Uh, we didn't change our bid. We knew we'd lose. We did lose. And the problem with these ethical issues is that doing the right thing often produces a bad outcome in the short term. And the bad outcome was that we lost. 
we had to lay off some of our employees who were counting on winning this contract for their work. And uh, uh, yet, we clearly had done the right thing. Uh, other ethical issues, uh, let me uh, cite one that comes to mind. It wasn't myself, but it was the CEO of Procter & Gamble. Uh, they had a, a market intelligence group that uh, gathered information on their competitors. Uh, the idea was to read uh, professional trade journals, uh, look at patents, read the other company's press releases, and try to figure out where the other company was going, all using open material. <coughs> Uh, the person running this was a good friend of his, a neighbor. They'd been friends for much of their life. Uh, he discovered one, he, the CEO, discovered one day that uh, this group had expanded beyond what he had had in mind. And they were dumpster diving, uh, meaning they were going through the trash outside the other company's plant and looking for information. Uh, some would argue that uh, going through the trash, they should be throwing stuff out if they uh, didn't want people to go through it. Uh, that wasn't his view. It was his view that uh, they hadn't intended uh, his company to have the information. Uh, he promptly fired the guy who was running this group, uh, transferred all the others, uh, went to the competitor and told him what happened, returned the documents they gathered, and the other company turned around and sued him for $10 million, which they settled for $10 million. Uh, he clearly did the right thing. Uh, sadly, another example of where in the short term it didn't turn out so well. But in, in the long term, it, it clearly was the right thing to do. Those are just a couple of quick examples of sorts of things you, you do run into. Yes? Uh, how do you decide like, when to listen to, to your advisors and when to not? Because like in the case of Johnson & Johnson, the CEO, if CEO would have listened to what uh, his advisors were saying, he wouldn't have recalled the medicine. But in other case, you said, you, you gave examples when people didn't listen to what their advisors said and they blew up. I can only hear part of that. Were you able to pick that up? Yeah, the, the question was uh, how do you decide when to listen to your advisors and when not? Uh, some, some examples, uh, the advisors, for example, the J&J &J example, the title all the advisors gave uh, advice to the CEO or really advice, where in other cases uh, the advisors gave good advice. Great question, uh, hard question. Uh, I think at least the essence of the, the answer is that most of the advice you tend to get is from people with a fairly narrow perspective. Uh, they're protecting you from the legal perspective. They're protecting you from the engineering perspective. Uh, they're protecting you from the accounting perspective. And it's your job to weigh all that and protect yourself, your company, from an overall perspective or do the right thing from an overall perspective. And for example, I think it's, it's very important to listen to the lawyers, listen to the advice, because you sure don't want to do anything illegal. Uh, but don't let the lawyers run your decision process, for example, during a crisis. Uh, that's one of the biggest mistakes people make, is they, uh, they let the lawyers try to protect the company's uh, financial interests, and they wind up having the lawyers destroy the company's reputation, which is much more important than your financial interests. And so, Clearly, this gets to be an issue of judgment. But I think if you realize that people are giving you advice from a given perspective, and your role is to try to weigh that, uh, more often than not, you can uh, come up with, uh, with the right answer. Warren? This is a, a sort of a wacky question. But, but as a legal leader, you have to allocate resources and challenge certainty. Your career is brought in so many people, people in business, the government. As a leader of an aerospace company, um, how do you evaluate the opportunities in terms of thinking out of the box, like evaluating, you know, alternative life forms in other universes? Because you're you are the product, you stretch the envelope what most people. And how do you evaluate, you know, considering those communications, intercepting? Like movie contact, is all that whacked up, no business opportunities, or no, I mean, how do you, how do you factor that in and listen to your scientists? You know, the, the question, if I do justice to it, is uh, how do you make resource allocation decisions that require you to evaluate uh, a spectrum of opportunities, some of which may include things that are totally dissimilar from what you've done before, that are out of the box? Uh, 
Do I do justice to the question? Uh, the uh, we've tried to have a fairly disciplined way of doing that from the various organizations I've been involved with. Uh, we try to uh, assess what is the uh, likely payoff uh, uh, of pursuing a particular course. We try to assess what's the downside of pursuing a particular course. Uh, we try to decide is the payoff worth the risk. We try to decide what can we do to minimize the risk. And we always try to make sure that we can survive the worst case outcome uh, if it really goes badly. Uh, where you come into problems is the kind of thing you describe where you have something that's a low probability of success, uh, but it has a huge payoff. And so you're multiplying a very large number by a very large, by a very small number, you know, which I guess is about the worst kind of arithmetic. And, uh, uh, that's when it gets very difficult. Uh, uh, but it's my belief that you occasionally have to step up and throw the long ball. You've got to take the chance. Uh, you can't just live by doing the safe thing all along. Uh, occasionally, you do have to try to do a really big job. Uh, but when you do, it's important to be very sure that the payoff is very big. Uh, and secondly, that you can survive if it doesn't turn out well. Uh, Newt Gingrich gave me some great advice in this regard once. Uh, he said that uh, uh, lions don't uh, lions don't hunt chipmunks because if they catch them, they starve to death, uh, which certainly argues for occasionally taking that big chance. Okay, well, let me take one more question here. Uh, as a leader of a, a large company like Lockheed Martin, are you at all concerned with the health? of the aerospace industry as a whole. Uh, if Lockheed Martin, for instance, makes a contract to uh, build a moon lander, what happens to the companies that, that didn't make it the contract, and how much concern do you put into, into that type of uh, consideration? Yeah, that, that's a good question, particularly in today's world. The question was, uh, how much do you worry uh, running an aerospace company uh, the, the, if you win some major program, uh, that you may basically put other companies out of business, uh, that uh, as you may wind up with a diminishing industry. What's your, how important is the industry's health as a whole? Is that fair portrayal? Uh, that's tough. Uh, when you're in a competition, uh, you do everything you can to win, obviously. Uh, and. Uh, you know, you pull out all the stops to win. Uh, but before you begin competing, there have been occasions where we've seen that if, if uh, we win this, we wipe out the rest of the industry in this area. And maybe we should team with the rest of the industry and somehow bid together. And we have a case right now that, like that is said, we're Boeing and Lockheed Martin are combining to form a joint venture to do space launch systems. Because uh, it was clear we were going to have two companies so weak that area that uh, they both be dreadfully inefficient. So uh, you do look at that view, <coughs> particularly if you're the customer, you tend to look at that view of when you put out requests for proposal and competitions. What is the consequence uh, of the industry? And uh, I, I was well aware that the worst thing that could happen to us, uh, but let me say it differently, there used to be about uh, 15 aerospace companies in this country, a uh, fair size. Uh, over the restructuring period that I described earlier, they got down to where there were two or three. Well, I can assure you the worst thing that could happen to the country, to our company, uh, to anyone, would be to have only one left. Because if that happened, particularly in our industry, it's almost certain that the government would uh, take it over uh, and run it. Uh, because that one company would have so much market power. And you can't afford to have that, particularly in a country, a company that deals with national security. Uh, but even in the commercial marketplace, uh, I think there's a lot of reason to worry about uh, any one company becoming dominant. I think as long as you have two viable competitors, you're in pretty good shape. Three is better, four is better. Two is a magic number. And uh, when I was with the government, I thought about that a lot. 
when I was in the industry, uh, I thought mainly about winning. But I will confess that uh, we nonetheless used to talk to our government counterparts about the consequences of the way they were arranging competitions. Good question. So maybe we're going to have a reception outside right, right after Norm will be there. So maybe we can defer other questions to that reception. Uh, before we, uh, so let's, let's thank Norm. <laughs>